Across all the continents, for four generations and nine decades, hundreds of millions of men, women and children served in comradeship for one of the most unjust and bloody systems in the history of mankind, communism. What mysterious force, what power of seduction drew those who wanted to change the world and shape their own destiny under the banner of communism? Why, in spite of the well-known crimes and the reversal from its original ideals, was the big lie able to go on for so long? The answer is still unclear. Communism was a strange mix of humanism and terror, of brotherhood and cynicism, of self-sacrifice and misery. In it, we find a paradoxical juxtaposition of good and evil. Why, for so many years, did the image of earthly paradise mask the hell lying beneath? Eisenstein's film, October, the revolution was transformed into a struggle of epic heroism. From the very beginning, the revolution was staged. A huge gap opened between the real and the imaginary, truth and belief, which lasted until the end of communism. The glorious imagery of the revolution is far removed from the reality of a handful of Bolsheviks being almost unopposed as they took control of the Winter Palace and other strategic points of Petrograd. Yet, the transformation of the 1917 Petrograd uprising into the triumphant revolution of downtrodden proletariat united behind its party and leaders became the cornerstone of the faith. The October Revolution was the example to follow, the model for the whole world. Beijing to Havana, Prague to Saigon, the legend of the October Revolution has continued to haunt the century. The new government quickly announced its intention to leave World War I by declaring war on war itself. Bolshevism set an example to the civilized world and championed the idea of brotherhood between peoples. In the trenches of Europe, the slaughter had been going on for three years. In futile offensives and pointless counteroffensives, the youth of the continent had been all but wiped out. Lenin had opposed the war from 1914, 
His declaration that the imperialist bourgeoisie was wholly responsible for this holocaust rang more than true in the ears of the young men faced with the daily barbarism. By demanding the opening of peace negotiations, the Bolsheviks were answering the call of 10 million soldiers still fighting the war. Some had rediscovered the old battle cry of internationalism. Workers of the world unite and even fraternized with the enemy. Hate for the war boosted the anti-capitalist revolt. In Moscow, Lenin paid homage to his forefathers by inaugurating a statue of Marx and Engels. In the eyes of the world, Lenin was seen to be putting Marx's predictions into practice. The abolition of capitalism, the overthrow of the bourgeoisie by the working classes. The fascination with the October Revolution still lays entirely in the belief that for the first time in history, revolution was led by the flags of the workers. For the workers of Europe, there was no doubt. The Russian proletariat had taken over the reins of power. Lenin was building utopia right here, right now. In the eyes of the people, the October Revolution was of cosmic proportions. The star of the East was lighting up world history. A month after the revolution came civil war. Opposition to Bolshevik power came in the shape of the White Army supported by Western powers. The fledgling state was attacked on all fronts and needed to mobilize and whip up enthusiasm. The victory of the Red Army under Trotsky's modernization reinforced further still the prestige of the Young Revolution. Alone for two years, it had triumphed against domestic and foreign enemies, and thus was born a new myth, that of the invincible army of people freed by revolution. Bolsheviks were in power in Russia, but Lenin felt that power could only be maintained if the revolution was followed in other countries. We shall perish, he declared, if we cannot hold on until our revolution receives sufficient help from revolts in every country. First in Lenin's thinking was Germany, the land of Marx, a powerful industrialized country with an organized proletariat. For the Bolsheviks, revolution in Germany meant their own survival. In January 1919 in Berlin, the Spartacus League, led by Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, organized an uprising that was brutally crushed by the Social Democrat government. The two leaders were assassinated. A Red Commune was formed in Bavaria, but it too was squashed. Hopeful Russians followed these movements closely and took to the streets to demonstrate against the assassinations of Luxembourg and Lipnesht. Not put off by these early setbacks, the Bolsheviks continued to promote worldwide revolution, which more than strategy was their raison d'etre. 
and Lenin seemed to be right as Europe was thrown into turmoil. The disbanding of the German and Austro-Hungarian empires set off revolutionary fervor throughout Central Europe. In the spring of 1919, Hungary was declared a council republic led by Bela Kuhn. For 143 days, Hungarian communists kept alive the revolutionary dream. But in August, they made their last stand against troops sent by the West to crush Hungarian communism. In Moscow, Lenin held a congress to set up a new international, the third, to replace the second socialist international. It was officially founded at the second congress in the summer of 1920 as the Communist International or Comintern. Before they got down to a serious debate, the communists celebrated with a grandiose parade. The delegates acclaimed the life forces of the revolution. This was the joyous, almost innocent forerunner of parades to come across Red Square. On the balconies of the Kremlin, surrounded by the leaders of Bolshevism, Kamenev, Zinoviev, and Bukharin, young revolutionaries from every continent, had fun in their own way. Most were in their early 30s and were already proclaiming themselves leaders of the world's proletariat. They danced on the statue of the Tsar. Moscow was at their feet, and so, according to them, was the world. All the believers in world revolution attended the Comintern Congress. 217 representatives from 37 countries gathered in the Kremlin. John Reed, American journalist and militant, author of 10 Days That Shook the World, would catch typhus and die several weeks later. Militants met in the exalting and exalted communion of absolute faith to early communism. The delegates partook in fevered debate as history was being made in the here and now before their very eyes. Revolution was parked in Poland, and in support, the Red Army marched on Warsaw. Zinoviev, the head of the Comintern, followed events with hourly updates by telephone. All of the conditions were in place for the revolutionary flame to set alight the whole continent of Europe. The Red Army, though, was defeated. But this did nothing to stifle messianic fervor. Next year or the year after, in 10 years or in 200, revolution would triumph. It was preordained, part of future history. At the Congress, Trotsky gave the new creed for the militant communist. In all activities, the communist must be faithful to himself, a disciplined member of his party, an implacable enemy of the capitalist society, its economic regime, its state, its lies of democracy, its religion, and its morality. 
He is a devout soldier of the proletarian revolution and the indefatigable proclaimer of the new society. At the Second Congress, Lenin laid out 21 draconian conditions for membership of the common term. One of these was a definitive break from social democracy, which was too inclined to ally itself with the bourgeoisie. Convinced of the imminence of the revolution, Russian communists wanted to see parties in their own image sprouting up everywhere. Disciplined, skilled in clandestine organization, and capable of taking and maintaining power. The voted manifesto put it in black and white. The Communist International is the International Party of Insurrection and the dictatorship of the proletariat. It was an extremely centralized organization. On the revolutionary map, the Bolshevik leaders Trotsky, Zinoviev and Bukharin carried a lot of weight. Having had their own revolution, the Russians felt they were the experts in revolutionary savoir-faire. Over the next few months, parties faithful to Moscow sprang up in Poland, Germany, France, Spain, Italy, Belgium, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Switzerland, Mexico, Uruguay, Brazil, Turkey, Egypt, Iran, Indonesia, China, Japan, Australia, and the United States. In Britain, home of capitalism, the communists recruited from the unions of miners and dockers. In France, one of the founders of the Communist Party was Marcel Cachin. 34 years later, at the 50-year anniversary of the communist newspaper L'Humanité, he perpetuated the legend of those heroic days. L'accueil le plus fraternel. Il nous dit, je vous attendais, vous les Français. Il avait, pour la vieille tradition révolutionnaire française, la plus grande admiration. Et il se proclamait lui-même un Jacobin de 93 au service du prolétariat mondial. 1920, un grand congrès réuni à tout vote à une écrasante majorité l'adhésion du Parti français à la Nouvelle Internationale. Most of the members of the new Communist Party were those who escaped alive from the trenches. They had an unconditional hatred of the bourgeoisie whom they held responsible for World War I. Facing a world of anguish and hopelessness, they sought common ground. Small groups of miners, steel workers, and railway men, revolted by their living and working conditions, joined together under the banner of the new party. For all of them, membership meant total commitment and an acceptance of repression. But the communist mystique gave them a strong sense of pride at belonging to an elite in full evolution. In January 1921, at the Italian Socialist Party Congress in Livorno, a splinter group broke away and became the Italian Communist Party. For several months, 
Italy seemed to be on the point of a revolution. The factories of Fiume and Turin were paralyzed by strikes. Four hundred thousand steel workers occupied factories above which flew the hammer and sickle. Machine guns were installed on the factory roofs. While in the countryside, peasants raised a red flag and claimed the land as they had in Russia. The landowners panicked and called on squads of fascist black shirts who started a reign of terror. Overnight, Italy went from red to black, and Mussolini marched on Rome to take power. For 20 years, Italian communism would remain buried. Germany was finding it hard to shake off the ghosts of war. The economy was in crisis, inflation soared, strikes and demonstrations turned into riot. As a young man named Hitler joined the National Socialist Party and attempted a putsch in Bavaria, the Comintern thought the situation sufficiently ripe to take power. The Bolshevik leaders were convinced that this time revolution would triumph in Germany and that world history would be swept off its feet. From Moscow, the leaders planned an armed insurrection. But distance proved too much of a barrier in seizing power. Orders were lost or arrived late, and the Comintern was left facing another failure. The German Revolution would have to wait. The beaten German communists fled to Russia. beaten were received as victors. Poland, Germany, Hungary, Italy, the defeats did nothing to shake the faith. The next one would succeed. No momentary failure would get in the way of those who had been ordained to change history. Communists, chased out of Hungary, arrived in Moscow with their holy banner held high, and the Ari flame fed the flame of revolt. Moscow became a sanctuary for refugee militants before they went out on new crusades. Once we have taken power, we shall never let go, forewarned Lenin. The municipal councils, or Soviets, which were established after the revolution as an important forum where the people could vote decisions, became a fiction that would abuse generations of believers. In fact, over several months, the Bolsheviks took complete control of the Soviets. These institutions for the people had come to be symbols of Bolshevik power over the people. The political police, the Cheka, which was founded a month after the revolution, grew from 1,000 members in 1918 to 500,000 members by the spring of 1921. The Cheka would remain until the fall of communism under its different acronyms, GPU, OGPO, NKVD, MVD, MGB, and finally, KGB. The contradiction was total. While the proletariat of the world dreamt of a classless society where the workers were master, all of the components of totalitarianism were being put into place. The one-party dictatorship, the omnipresent political police, and the removal of opposition. From the very beginning, the need to believe was stronger than the truth. The power of belief refused to see the reality.
But truth refuses to go away. After the Civil War, Russia was drained. The economy was in ruins. War communism, the migration of the population, and land requisition in the countryside resulted in a fall in agricultural production. Drought worsened the famine, which caused the death of five million people. But the Bolsheviks were able to exploit this disaster, for which they were in large part responsible by organizing a solidarity campaign with communist parties the world over. International aid finally arrived. The truth can be hidden, but never ignored. Economic disaster enforced a new direction, which Lenin, in turn, forced on the country. The new economic policy, or NEP, gave the country some breathing space, and little by little, things improved. In the countryside, the peasants were able to work their plots of land, and slowly agricultural production resumed. Supplies began to find their way to the cities. Industry started up. NEP years were also years of cultural pluralism, social experimentation, educational reform, and legislation making divorce and abortion easier. The NEP gave rise to a cultural renaissance and a great vitality in intellectual domains. The shaking up of society the movement of art away from the bourgeois imagery to that of the proletariat, architectural innovation, all made it seem to those abroad that a new state was inventing itself in much the same way as it was inventing in all fields. Very early on, the Bolsheviks developed an unparalleled mastery of the art of propaganda. Huge shows were as innovative as they were hymns to the glory of the working class and youth. Trains crisscrossed the country, spreading communism's evangelical message. Millions of posters, essays, and newspapers bore witness to the power of the written word. This earthly paradise became a kind of tourist attraction, more often than not for foreign communists, but also for writers and artists like George Bernard Shaw, who thought they were witnessing, in the Soviet Union, the evolution of mankind. The new faith took its rituals from existing religion, like in the secular baptism where the child of the revolution is baptized in the very factory where its mother works. The workers down tools for the ceremony. The 
Bolsheviks wanted to change man completely, to purge him of all the alienation that existed in the old society. In the name of the future, despite a still uncertain present, the past was wiped clean off the slate. There were organized demonstrations against alcoholism, with children holding banners saying, Daddy, please stop drinking. Vodka became the target of the communist moral majority. A huge campaign was launched to combat illiteracy, an obstacle to the diffusion of political ideology. Through the written word, communism would be able to reach even the remotest countryside. Children were at the forefront of the crusade to create new man. The pioneers represented the success of the revolution, the egalitarian society of tomorrow with complete integration. Communism was the youth of the world. Cinema developed hand in hand with the revolution. The best directors and cameramen worked for the cause. This footage by Vratov shows young communists arriving for a Saturday of voluntary work in the fields. Enemies of the people were invited to redeem themselves through hard work. Opponents to Bolsheviks' ideology were imprisoned in newly opened concentration camps. Over time, these camps metamorphosed into the gulags of Siberia. This footage, shot in the 1920s in the Soloviki Islands, the regime shows its camps to be examples of the ideal society, where divines can be reintegrated as long as they are prepared to roll up their sleeves and get down to work. camps turn so-called criminals into real men. We are not slaves, writes this woman with pride. In the Gulag theater, prisoners put on plays and dream of becoming stars. Lenin suffered a serious stroke and was no longer able to fulfill his responsibilities as leader. Cinema Newsreel kept the country up to date with the leader's health condition. In January 1924, Lenin died.
The general secretary of the party, Stalin, organized the funeral. He also set up a commission to immortalize Lenin and turn him into a cult figure. His body was embalmed against the wishes of Lenin's wife and displayed to the faithful in the mausoleum. Was Stalin inspired by the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb the previous year? The body of Lenin, atheist, empiricist and materialist, was turned into a sacred symbol, a sacrosanct part of Russia's heritage. Stalin, an ex-student of theology, surrounded the Lenin legacy with liturgy. Lenin's writings were posted as pontifical dogma, his theories translated into vernacular Vulgate. With the death of Lenin came the birth of Leninism. At the party conference, several weeks after his death, Lenin's inheritors present a united front. And yet, the inner circle knew that in his will, Lenin had recommended that Stalin should not be allowed to come to power. Trotsky, who had already started to express certain reservations, was even self-critical. I know one cannot be right against the party, he said. One can only be right with the party and through the party. As head of the delegates, he did not yet stand out from the crowd. But soon, nobody or nothing would be able to impede Stalin's rise to power. Over the next few years, those surrounding him would disappear, either shot, imprisoned, or exiled. But for the moment, he was content to be the modest Joseph Chugashvili and listen to his rival, Trotsky. It was not yet time to turn the screw. In Paris, like elsewhere, Lenin was remembered. The communist worker of the Paris suburbs, eyes filled with the hope of changing the world and his life, saw in Moscow only a harmonious society. And when militants, such as Barbus or the young Torres, went on their pilgrimages to Moscow, what they saw and heard only reinforced their convictions. A revolutionary visit to the Soviet Union was the only way of discovering the truth. And the Russians were expert in selecting what truth could be visited. Here, De Jeter, the composer of the International, is received with great pomp. In the eyes of French communists, the Bolsheviks were the hire to the French Revolution of 1789 and the Communard of 1871. The taking of the Winter Palace sent out to the world the same message as the storming of the Bastille. 1917 was the realization of the French Revolution of a successful commune. When a delegation arrived carrying the banner of the Paris Commune, they were merely transferring the eternal flame of revolution to Moscow. At the fifth Comintern Congress in 1924, the delegates inaugurated the visit to Lenin's mausoleum. Communist faith, like other religions, was fed by the cult of the dead. At this Congress, it was the delegates from what would later be called the Third World that held center stage. Fever was dying down in Europe. The Indian communist, M.N. Roy, announced, we have immense revolutionary potential. The Comintern must take advantage of it. Ho Chi Minh from Indochina 
denounced colonialism and called for anti-imperialist revolt. Revolution was brewing among the oppressed peoples of the tropics. Nineteen twenties China, ripped apart by civil war and swept up by nationalist fervor, seemed ripe for an anti-imperialist revolution. The Chinese Communist Party, made up of a few thousand militants, helped organize a series of strikes, demonstrations, and riots. In 1927, they sparked off the Shanghai Uprising, portrayed by André Malraux in The Man's Fate. The insurgents were crushed. Some were even thrown alive into the furnaces of steam trains. Under the leadership of Mao Zedong, the surviving communists learned a valuable lesson from this disaster. From now on, as the Chinese population was made up mostly of peasants, the revolution would take place in the countryside. Mao set up a base in Hunan and started his long march to power that would take 20 years. In Moscow, a parade was held in support of the Chinese Revolution, but slogans alone were not enough for victory. After Lenin's death, Trotsky was continually claiming that the revolution had been betrayed by the party, which had established a dictatorship over the working classes. But it was too late. Stalin's men were in place. He had complete control in the Bolshevik party and the common turn. In opposition to Trotsky, who continued to believe in international revolution, the new master of the Kremlin decided on the policy of revolution in a single country. The USSR was no longer the means to world revolution, it was the end. Expelled from the party in 1927, exiled to Kazakhstan in 1929, Trotsky, a leader of the October Revolution, was reduced to preaching from soapbox to soapbox, pursued by Stalin's henchmen. For the militants of Europe and America, Moscow is now far away. They have their own battles to fight with their bosses, the police, and the army. Imprisoned, persecuted, beaten, they could only find solace in the belief that their ideology was the right way. In the meantime, these rebels without a revolution copied the Soviet model. German communists organized Spartan galas, or Spartacades, of Muscovite proportions. In France, each year, the party gathered its sympathizers at the Fête de l'Humanité, where party leaders and members could rub shoulders in militant comradeship. 
this small clique started the ritual and established the ground rules for membership of the extended communist family, a counterculture whose members had the heady feeling of belonging to a new aristocracy. Sheltered from a naturally hostile world by the certitude of their belief, microversions of the one-party state sprang up everywhere. The public and private life of a communist was entirely invested in the party. This quest for the absolute also became a personal quest, turning communist commitment into something sacrosanct where doubt was forbidden. The faith of the good could be nothing but good. At the end of the 20s, the strong attraction to communism was not based on the relatively unknown reality of the Soviet regime. The Russian Revolution had changed the course of history. That was enough to feed the imagination and intensify passion. The revolution was appealing because it demanded, above all else, the willingness of the people. If you want, you can.